Aloha and welcome to season two, episode two, arbitrarily determined the seasons that is, of Figments, the Power of Imagination. This show is intended to entertain you and inspire you, and it might do that, probably will do both today. Um, I am making a big sacrifice to uh, watch the, or to conduct this show right now because my Milwaukee Brewers, that's the shirt, are playing the Chicago Cubs starting in 10 minutes in a pivotal series between the Central Division leading Brewers and I can't give the full name of the Cubs without violating some FCC standard. But it's worth it because today I'm going to have a, a good friend from boyhood days who's become a better friend through, thanks to the connections of the internet. And he's going to tell you about his figment. And the reason I wanted to have Dick, let me first talk about figments um, because if you're a new viewer, or if you haven't watched for a while, figments are kind of fanciful notions that enter your mind and they have a bit of a bad reputation as, as being just that fantasies. And they're the root of all great innovations, accomplishments, ideas uh, that make a difference. When the dreamer dreams enough and has enough determination, perseverance, and good luck to make his dream reality. So I'm a car guy. You may not know that unless I said it in a previous episode and you watched the episode, but I'm a car guy. I've got a slightly modified Mustang uh, that you can see here. Um, nice. I like that car a lot. In Hawaii, it just means I can merge like a big dog because there's no real place to let it eat, let the big dog eat. So I fancy myself a car guy, but uh, through Facebook and other means, I've reconnected with a friend from my days in Shawano, Wisconsin, not spelled like it sounds, named Dick Karth. And I'm happy to have him here as a guest and talk about how he said to his wife, Kathy, honey, I bought a race car. Aloha, Dick, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be with you. It's a, it's a great story, but you're not such a fanciful guy, and we'll get to that in a bit. I, you're pretty serious about this. Now, we we both grew up near a half-mile clay oval in uh, Shawano, Wisconsin, at the fairgrounds. We don't think this is the actual track, but we both watched cars like this race around that oval, and uh, I remember it vividly. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I was, I was uh, as a kid, went to the races just about every weekend yep. on Saturday night. And uh, my first recollection ever of going to a motorsports event was um, the, my, my family owned a funeral home and back in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. funeral homes typically in small communities provided ambulance service. So it was our funeral home's turn to provide ambulance service for the, for the fairgrounds during the fair and they had uh, midgets racing. And this was in the days of, of if people know anything about motorsports, midgets were very small cars, four cylinder engines. I remember my dad talking to one of the owners and the guy said he had about 90 horsepower in it. But really? looking back, those cars didn't have a lot of protection. Um, <laughs> the drivers went into the corners and had to pump a hand fuel pump to be able to keep the fuel pressure up. and uh, no, I thought that was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And then after I got older to the point where I could be out alone on a Saturday night, then my parents allowed my brother and I and the neighbor guy up the street, probably a friend of yours, Jim Spiegel, to go, oh, to, yeah. the, go to the stock car races on Saturday night because his dad was in the VFW and worked the, the beer stand. So we had a ride out to the track and, and back. So I just about went there every I, I, we rarely missed a race. I remember, well, I, I remember the days that my parents, for whatever reason, probably bad behavior, didn't let me go to the races. And, and we were close enough on Fairview Way to, to hear it. Oh, it drove me crazy to hear the cars racing around the track and not be able to see it. Dick, another memory I have is on that clay track, the clumps of clay coming off the wheels as they went into the corner. It was awesome. It, it really was. Uh, and, and going back, and I, I've learned this since then through some of the, the people that I've met through racing, but the guys that raced in the 50s and 60s, there were no places to buy parts. 
they bought everything came out of the junkyard um, uh, exhaust pipes oftentimes were drive shafts and the cars were pretty rude and crude to drive but at the same time um, a lot of them honed their skills and some of those guys that you and i watched at the shano fairgrounds went on to race in usac and the usac stock car series yeah and they they were as you said pretty crude cars but to me they were just awesome machines and you know i'm a dinosaur who loves the sound of a reciprocating engine and uh, man it was beautiful so tell us a little if you would about your family and and your upbringing and uh, what led you to your eventual life in racing well our our family was my mom and dad and uh brother and sister and uh as as we were growing up um I was, I was not much of an athlete. I wasn't into sports. We went up to circle drive once in a while and I tried to play baseball and that didn't work out <laughs> well. Ditto. And, and, and uh, then we um, started uh, skiing. There was a ski hill built west of Shano on Elder Kunchke's Hill. They used mm -hmm. a tractor to create a rope bow to pull us up the hill. And I, I seemed to enjoy that uh, and, and got, where I could get down the hill without having too much uh, uh, excitement. And uh, I recall vividly uh, going with the Shano High School Ski Club, which was actually an outlaw club. The, the school would not sanction it for the liability. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, went up to uh, Powderhorn. And uh, I think your family had a, had a place up there. And yeah. uh, I remember you as being one of the hot shot skiers. Uh, your name was on a list of, of guys that had done real well on the slalom and whatever else they had there. So well, I, I was voted most likely to be exciting, but not very good. So uh, yeah, don't don't oversell that. But our family did ski. And just to talk about our upbringing in Shano, and our families were both living pretty well at the time, but but our the the place we had uh the first one i remember was in cable or in i'll think of the name of the place outside of hurley and all nine of us slept in a one-room house so don't think of a luxury chalet viewers it wasn't so anyway so you're you're living life and uh professionally you went to school and got into financial management i'm going to kind of summarize it and Dick, uh, uh, after we spoke about three weeks ago, getting ready for this show, and I reflected on what you'd shared about your journey in racing, it really occurred to me that you're a very methodical guy, and you've taken the same approach to this journey to having your own race car. Is that a fair description? I, I, I think it is. I, I spent my career, almost all of it in the mortgage business the last few years. Uh, I spent with an operational risk for m and Bank and, and BMO Harris from Toronto. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I learned that in, in being successful in business, you can't take giant, huge leaps at one time. Things come along methodically. That was not my plan in racing when I bought the race car. Um, I had all, I, I, we started going to the Indianapolis 500 in 1968. Yeah, and I know I know that race, and we had hoped to have you on the Monday after, but schedule didn't work. But that race is special to you, right? Yep. We uh, um, a Chevy dealer in in Shano, Bert Anderson, who was originally yep. from Chicago, uh, was very close to the Bentonhausen family, and he told my dad, he said, "You need to go and take your sons to the Indy 500." Uh, it's an experience they will never forget. So my parents bought tickets when they were driving back from Florida, when they drove through Indianapolis, went to the ticket office, bought three tickets. We went to the race in 68. And uh, that was really something. My dad okay. renewed tickets and we started going every year thereafter. And I think there were, uh, I had to miss the race twice due to weddings in the family. And twice it was rained out on race day and I wasn't able to stay for one day it got delayed to Wednesday. Another uh, another year it got delayed to the following weekend, and work wouldn't allow me to go there. But I've been to a lot of races there, and uh, we continue to go back uh, every year since then. 
I'm going to guess that just doing simple fighter pilot math, that, that means you may have been to the Indy 500 50 times. I right? think I think I've been there 50 times. I know that wow. uh, I've been I've been in my seat at the at the start time more than 50 times. Uh, twice it was pouring. Wow. So we sat in the upper deck underneath a canopy, so we were dry. Oh, that's cool. So. Um, Eventually, having been around racing, and there's a lot I'd love to talk about that we probably won't have time. We'll see, like your flying experience, because we share that passion as well. But eventually, at age what, you bought a race car? 52. 5'2". Five 5'2". Two. Wow. Five two. Got it. And uh, I, I took poetic license on the, the tagline for this. And uh said the put the tagline was honey i bought a race car but it really isn't that your wife kathy knew that you were thinking about it and you mentioned as we did the lead in to the show that you really want to mention the folks who've been supportive to you in your racing pursuit and clearly she's right there at the top of the list yeah. I, without her I, I would never have been able to do it uh we were living in new york city from 2002 to 2005 and commuting to Bristol, Tennessee for the NASCAR races. Mm -hmm. And I had been to Road America for a vintage event and I saw vintage Indy cars and I saw vintage stock cars. And I actually went to a vintage Indy car dealer in St. Louis to look at some cars. <laughs> who knew there was, who, who even knew there was a vintage Indy car dealer? <laughs> and, and unfortunately he talked me out of an Indy car. And uh -huh. my, my, my friend Dick Trickle from Wisconsin Rapids had driven a car for Junie Donlevy of Richmond, Virginia. And coming back, I knew that we were going to be real close to Richmond. So I called Junie's shop, talked to him, said I wanted to, wanted to buy one of Dick's old cars. And he said, well, stop by. So on Monday after the race, we stopped by. And to make a long story short, that was in August and in February, he called me and he said, I got a car for you. Come look at it. We drove down from New York, looked at it. I agreed to buy it. Got my job in Milwaukee with M&I and mm -hmm. took the delivery of the car uh, in August. Hey, Dick, let me interrupt to uh, just say Dick Trickles was a friend of yours. Um, and he's somebody I know that you think a lot of and work for his memorial project. Legendary racer. Over 1,200 victories um didn't do as well at the highest levels of nascar for some but a legendary racer how did you get to know dick triple how did that happen i lived in lacrosse for 23 years and mm -hmm. real lacrosse wisconsin on the west side of wisconsin for uh, those of us here in hawaii the Oklahoma train company and um we, i was working for a real estate company and, and we were doing business with a real estate developer and in, in uh in lacrosse by the name of Charlie Raymond. And we were at a meeting uh, at the end of May and my boss wanted to have another meeting on the last Friday of May. And I said, I'm not gonna be here, I'm taking off that day. And Charlie looked at me and he said, I'm not gonna be here either that day. And he said, are you going south? And I said, yeah. And he said, so am I. So we realized that both of us were race fans. He was a big, longtime friend of trickles and a big supporter. Uh -huh. he introduced me to dick and i started following him then and through dick i i went to a lot of nascar races and spent some time with him and uh i decided if i'm going to have a an old stock car i want one of his an old stock car uh, something you mentioned as we were uh, getting ready for this is that you've never bought yourself a new car true that is correct <laughs> but you did buy this car I this race car, the one behind you, and we've got another uh, graphic without your face in front. That is your car. That's act, Well, that's actually the uh, NASCAR Xfinity car I drove at Road America two ah. years ago. Um, the, the, the trickle car was the Heilig Myers car, as you can see. Yeah, feel free to give a plug. We don't get, there's no money in this on ThinkTech, folks. So. Anymore, but they're nice people. Um, I bought the car from Junie, he, he outfitted it for me and uh, connected me to Joe Ryan and Gary, Indiana, who put the engine in it. And the car was all put together by uh, Ken Bell 
uh, a Junie's shop foreman. And uh, I picked it up, hauled it back to Wisconsin, and then uh, went to driver school. Okay, let's stop there for just a minute. Let me put a plug in and take a quick commercial break, if you will, and tell you that uh, we are brought to you by Think Tech Hawaii, a nonprofit corporation that can use your support. You can go to their website, thinktechhawaii, all one word, dot com. Don't put the all one word in there and uh, make a donation if you would. Um, they bring you both this show, The Power of Imagination, and my commentary show, Figments on Reality. Now, there won't be a Figments on Reality. That's the reality of the holiday weekend next week. But uh, we'll be back in a few weeks and uh, see you then in Figments on Reality. So, Dick, when you bought this car, did you buy it to have in the garage and say, I've got the coolest garage ever? Or did you really intend to race it? You indicated you went to driving school, so you at least intended to drive it. Right. I, I made arrangements to buy the car. My plan was to, to run it in vintage events up at Road America near Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And during the time that the car was being finished out for me by, by Don Levy's shop, Adding small things like an engine, right? Because it didn't come with an engine. Uh, I was connected to a guy by the name of Chuck King from West Chicago. And Chuck has worked for various USAC stock car teams and, and uh, NASCAR teams. And he said what I should do is go to the driver school at Midwestern Council of Sports Car mm -hmm. Clubs. It's going to have uh, in uh, early September. So I checked that out and decided, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, I, I was so naive when I bought the cars. I bought it with one set of tires. <laughs> I got, probably I, not enough. No, not enough. Chuck said, well, you know, how, how, many sets of, how many sets of tires? That's four. Did you get with the car? I said, well, it's on four tires. Yeah. And he what said, well, you probably, you probably need more than that. So I, and so I went off to driver's school. and. Um, didn't know what I was doing. Uh, the, the comp director for Midwestern Council um, uh, criticized me for bringing a 3,400 pound, 750 horsepower car to come through driver school with, because it was by far the biggest car they'd ever had in driver school. And All right. uh, it's my car. Yeah. Um, one, one interesting uh, experience I had in driver school is. You, we start out and we play, uh, play follow the leader. And we mm -hmm. did that for a couple of laps with the yellow flag out at each flag stand on the corners. And then they dropped the, they dropped the yellow flag and now you can start to pass. So, okay, I'm going to go a little bit faster. And after a lap or two of that, I came out of the last turn to go down to the front straightaway. And I thought to myself, now's my opportunity to see what I paid all this money for and what I've been waiting for. So in second gear coming out of turn seven at Blackhawk Farms, I put the hammer down and the car took off and is like, holy smokes, this is, this is like <laughs> from a Cessna 150 to 900 horsepower and a Beach 18 on floats. I mean, it took off. And I got rocketing into the first corner, hammered the brakes. And the next thing I know, the car, the car is galloping like it's going over. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 culverts, and I couldn't figure out what that was. Went through the next corner, everything's fine. Checkered flag came out. I pulled into the paddock, parked next to my trailer. Chuck comes over and he said, Somebody's looking for you. And I got out of the car, and here's two of the safety workers, and each of them had a 42 pound piece of lead. And they said, We found these two in the grass. And the other one is out in the pucker brush somewhere, and we'll get it at lunchtime. And what had happened was the lead in one of the frame rails um, hadn't been properly fastened in. And when I hit it, the, yeah. it came flying out, went out in front of the car, and then I drove over all three pieces of the lead. Nice. So why do they call it pucker brush? I think I know, but why do they call it pucker brush? <laughs> But being a pilot, I think you and I understand. Yeah. A it's a tightening of a certain part of your body as things get bad and you get a what's called a pucker effect. Yeah, when, so, when you get out there, you're in an area you don't belong. 
so that's a great segue to what's your, if not that, what's your scariest moment? I have a picture of the car um, driving on the grass, which I don't think was intended. No. What's, what's your scariest moment in the in your car or any other race car? I think probably the one you're looking at there. Really? That's a, that's an ARCA stock car that some friends of mine put together uh, with me, and we ran it at Road America in 2017. And um, this, I, I qualified, I think, 23rd out of 38 cars. Okay. This is my first professional race, my first ARCA race. And um, I'm first lap going into turn 12, Canada Corner at Road America. And I think somebody touched me from behind. Um, there were no marks on the car, but all of a sudden I'm turned around. I'm looking at the inside of the fence and I'm waiting for somebody to hit me in the passenger side. Cause I've got at mm. this point, probably 12 <laughs> or 13 cars to come around me. They all made it around me. I was able to get going again and, and continue. But I, um, even though I've run, uh, 160, 65 at Road America. I've done probably 177 at uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway in a vintage event. I did a test at Daytona in an ARCA car and probably got up to 182, 185. Um, the car is always under control. But in this case, um, I didn't know what was going to happen. And, the, and, and of course, it's a steel body car. And when they hit it, it takes days to repair it, and that's the, the last thing I wanted to have happen was a was a, was a major. Yeah, probably would have taken days to repair you too. I know they've got their safety cages, but you know I would have been thinking about that. And I I share that sense of um, you know being in an airplane and a, a jet, whatever. Where as long as you're under control, even the risky things don't feel. Uh, I wouldn't say not risky, but if you get a vote, you feel like you've got it under control. When you don't have a vote, say the airplane is departing control flight, and I've experienced that, that's a bad feeling. I'm not up to being a passenger in a, in a fighter, and I'm sure you're not up to being a passenger in your race car. That's right. That's right. So let's, uh, time is flying. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about your, your mentor, Dick Trickle. Uh, as I said, he's uh, he was a short track legend um, and with over 1,200 victories. What did you learn from him and about him uh, that that drew you to him? Uh, I, I I knew the name Dick Trickle when I first was introduced to him by Charlie Raymond. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew he was successful. I, 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 yeah. When I would read the Milwaukee Sentinel on Monday mornings after a USAC race at State Fair Park, Dick's name was always close to the top. Uh, but only after I met him and interacted with him and had and Charlie told me the Dick Prickle story did I realize here's a guy racing short tracks. Um, they raced uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and some Sundays. They had a race in the afternoon and in the evening, and they had specials on Tuesdays. He, all he did was this short track racing that um, a lot of, for a lot of guys was a hobby, but he made a living. At it. He, had, he had two or three employees at the time. He had two trucks to haul three or four race cars around. He had a dedicated race shop, and, and he truly made a living and owned a home and raised a family through 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 relatively small time motorsports. Once and that was that was the outlier at the time. I can remember guys showing up at the Shano track with their beat up pickup pulling a trailer. And you know, it was as you said, just a hobby. I'm sorry I interrupted. Yep. And, and, and it was what I call the 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 golden days of short track racing, where mm -hmm. they, they could race on a budget with a modest sponsor and the purses were big enough. That that they could they could do well. I mean, Dick cons won consistently. Once he became yeah, a very and, consistent, and he was a very personable guy. Um, he, he ascribed to the um, 
uh, what, I, what I call the, the, the Richard Petty school of being a race car driver. You don't leave the track until you've signed the last, last autograph in the evening. It, it, all, it doesn't make any difference how late it is. If there's still people waiting in line for your autograph, you talk to them, get your picture taken, and you sign whatever they put in front of you. And that's the way Dick was. He was in demand by a lot of tracks all over the country because he had a good following. You know, they talk mm -hmm. about uh, uh, professional football teams and, and college teams traveling well. The Trickle fans traveled well and traveled extensively to watch him race. Yeah, and, you know, he got his success after I joined the Air Force and, and left Wisconsin for travels around the world, but I still knew uh, how well he was doing. Yeah, and, 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 his, and his story gets to be so interesting when he got a call at age 49 to fill in for an injured driver at, at Rockingham, North Carolina, uh, that really started his NASCAR career. He was the NASCAR Rookie of the Year at age 49. And I mean, that was the, the most bizarre thing that that ever happened. So, um, folks, I recommend you uh, Google or whatever your search engine of preference is, Dick Trickle. It's a, an amazing, amazing story, um, sad ending. And uh, Dick, I know that you still support the memorial uh, project and keep his memory alive. And I'm grateful for that. I'm not so grateful that this has gone by so quickly. Um, there's a lot more I'd love to talk about, including your flying, because you've done extensive flying in uh, float planes and other stuff that I haven't flown. But before we go, I do need to ask you, what's your current figment? So you lived the dream and bought your car, and I know there are many more stories to share on that, but what's your current dream, your figment? As, as far as racing goes, um, I want to run Bonneville. I'd like to run oh, wow. Bonneville salt tracks where yeah. salt track where speed records are set, folks. I, I, I want to run my um, High League Myers car over 200 miles an hour. And um, probably the most difficult thing would be for me to do would be I'd like to run um, the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Uh, like awesome. Yeah, the, the hill climb. I've, I've watched that on various shows and uh, I'm not going to Bonneville because I'm smarter than that uh, for my own skill level and probably not going to do the hill climb. My, uh, we usually close with what would Fig do? Here's what Fig would do. Fig would not get in his Mustang and think that he's Dick Carth. Okay, I'll remember that I'm just Dan Leaf on the streets of Oahu and try to keep things reasonable. Dick, an amazing story. I wish we had more time. Maybe we'll come back again sometime. Thanks so much for sharing your figment um, and how you made it reality and, and for making the time to talk with us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Keep up the good work. Oh, thanks. My pleasure. So that's it. In the can already. Another edition of Figments, the Power of Imagination, Season 2, Episode 2. No figments on reality next week. The following week in the next figments, The Power of Imagination, I'm going to try to talk my friend Ross Rowley, Rowley into coming back and talking baseball. If he doesn't, I will because I'm a fan and it'll be just the day before the All-Star game. So hopefully Ross and I will give our assessment of the season thus far and uh, our figment will be that we're MLB Network commentators, which we're not. So thanks again for viewing. Thanks to Think Tech Hawaii for hosting and aloha.